This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone, and welcome to the 130th, is that correct, Emma? 130th, uh, all right, 130th long table. It is my great pleasure to introduce today um, good friend and colleague, Dr. Jesse Kraft, who is our Resolute Americana Curator of the Americas. Um, Jesse, as many of you know, is an incredibly busy person. He um, publishes a great deal. Uh, well, since he started here at the ANS in 2019, he's been very busy at work publishing in the Journal of Early American Numismatics in the ANS magazine, a few other venues, and he is busy at work right now uh, trying to finish up a manuscript on a book that deals with foreign coin circulation in the uh, colonial period and early parts of um, the federal period here in the United States. Um, also trying to finish up the COAC volume um, uh, from our Brenner uh, conference a couple of years ago, while also now organizing a new COAC uh, conference to take place a little bit later this year. Um, and when he can find time, He's also then organizing the move of the Mako material from uh, places like Nevada and um, uh, and uh, Green Bay, uh, Michigan. In fact, he is going to be spending this coming weekend in Brooklyn at the warehouse, uh, supervising the arrival of Mako dyes and hubs from uh, Green Bay. So um, today he's taking a short break for an hour or so to. Uh, give us a paper on or give us a presentation on the great potency mint fraud of 1649. So Jesse, all yours. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you everyone for joining. As Peter mentioned, the 130th long table uh, here at the ANS. I'm going to share my screen, see if I can figure out how to do that. It's been a while since I've given a long table. Um, probably close to a year, I would imagine. So. Yeah, that looks like it's filling the screen and everything. All right. So this talk will outline one of the greatest cases of illegal debasement and fraud in all of numismatic history. Uh, numismatist and expert on Spanish-American coinage, Daniel Frank Sedwick, called this, quote, one of the most sordid episodes in numismatic history, end quote. This incident, while seemingly minor in the, the grand scheme of things, uh, had profound and long-lasting effects on the economic lives of many people throughout the world in the second half of the 17th century. There were international repercussions on uh, global trade, uh, an upset in monetary circulation patterns, and even a general distrust in money. Um, more broadly, not just in Spanish American, but uh, it ended up uh, kind of focusing in on that as time went on. So first, what is Potosi? Uh, Potosi is the name of a city that is located at the base of a mountain. So the mountain is Cerro Rico, which we can see in the picture here. Uh, this translates to Rich Hill, and in, in, is now in uh, the country of Bolivia. At the time, it, it was in the Viceroyalty of Peru, uh, which we'll get to. So the mountain was discovered in 1545 by a llama herder named Diego Hualpa. Uh, a mining town quickly developed at the base of the mountain, that is Potosí. Within decades, the town boasted a population of about 200,000 people. This is roughly the same size as London at the time. Uh, became the fourth largest Christian city, as well as the highest elevated city in the world. Um, I'm going to show you uh, if we could switch to the coin camera real quick. So this here is a very, very interesting piece. Uh, it's called Plata Corriente. Um, this is what circulated in Peru uh, and in and around Potosi and really the whole northern part of uh, South America. Um, after 1545, when, Spanish, or when silver was discovered, up until uh, the early or the late 1560s, so about 20 or 30 years of this circulating. Uh, as you can see, it's rough. It's not quite a coin, but it does have some sort of coin stamp on it. That's known as a tax stamp. Uh, this was likely the tax stamp of Philip II. Um, these are fairly rare uh, nowadays. Um, this is actually a good tax stamp as far as legibility goes. Um, finding one with a complete tax stamp, um, I'm not sure if any exist. 
So, uh, so this is actually a very, very, very recent acquisition by the ANS. I'm very happy to have this, and uh, it's the first and hopefully many pieces of Plot de Corriente that we get uh, because it's an extremely important um, chapter in the early history of monetary circulation in uh, South America and really the whole Western Hemisphere. So, happy to have that. All right. Share your screen again. So, in 1572, uh, after about 30 years of Plata Corriente in circulation, the Potosi Mint was founded. Um, the progression, there is a progression to get the Potosi is from Lima, which was founded in 1568, to the La Plata Mint, which actually only struck coins for about a month, possibly even just in one single instance, uh, to the Potosi Mint, uh, which was again at the base of Cerro uh, Rica. Uh, that in itself, that progression is really, truly a story within itself, so I won't get into too much detail. Uh, there's a lot of uh, political maneuvering happening where La Plata, I'm sorry, where Lima was the kind of the capital of all of um, Peru at the time, and then because of how far it was from Cerro Rico, they moved it to La Plata, which was the um, the capital of uh, the Tracas um, uh, Audiencia, which we'll get to. Um, and then finally, they were just like, forget it, we have to move them in directly to the source. So they finally moved it to Potosi. So here is uh, a handful of images of the Potosi Mint. It obviously still exists. These pictures are not from the 17th century. Uh, They're from the modern era. Uh, it's still very um, much as it was in the 17th century. Some of the machinery that you can see on the bottom right is more modern, but the stuff you see on the bottom left is 17th century. Uh, mint machinery that is no different than what you would find in other pla in, in Europe even. Um, I mean, these are really early modern European mint houses more than they are uh, anything that really uh, derived out of uh, what was existing in, in South America at the time. Okay, so here's a few maps. Where is Potosi? So, uh, if we look at the uh, high school uh, textbook looking map of South America to the left, uh, you'll see two kind of uh, regions. All the colored area is the viceroyalty of uh, Peru, but then uh, kind of like the United States, so it was divided into states. Uh, really, they were called audiencias. So we're looking at the dark blue audiencia, as well as the northern part of the blue-green. The blue-green area is actually where uh, Potosi is, that's the Audiencia of Charcas, but the darker blue to the left uh, is where Lima is, and that plays an important role as well. The map to the right is a, uh, an earlier map. Um, for those who you who aren't used to early uh, colonial maps, uh, they always come from facing the, uh, the coastline, so if it's a western uh, uh, kind of uh, map, it'll show, uh, it'll be looking eastward, and if it's showing the, the eastern coast, it'll be looking westward. Uh, so if we uh, kind of turn it, then we can see that it's the area that we're looking at, and then if we blow it up, we can see uh, two lakes. The top one is Lake Titicaca, and then the bottom is Lake Puopo, and if you look to the east of the bottom lake, uh, you can see Potosi. Um, if you look east of that, you can see La Plata, and then if you look all the way in the top west corner, uh, you can see Lima. So as you can see, it was quite a trek to take um, silver from Potosi to Lima just for uh, political reasons as the mint was there. So they decided to found the Potosi Mint. Uh, could we switch the coin camera, please? So once the mint was founded in 1572, uh, Potosi, these are the coins that were made. Uh, this is an eight real coin. Um, here we have a four real coin. They all had the same basic design on them of uh, uh, Castile and Leon, uh, the castle and line, that's uh, the dynasty, um, the roots that the Spanish Habsburg Empire uh, claimed from. As you can see, they're all basically the same. The other side will show the Habsburg shield. Uh, with uh, They're all very crude. Uh, these are known as cob coins. They were made in a, a very particular way. 
uh, that uh, is more for speed and efficiency rather than showing the whole design or any sort of beauty in the coin. It's literally just to make coins as quickly as possible to export them from South America. So that's uh, what the um, Potosi Mint and all the other mints in South America were making at the time. Um, but as you can see, uh, sometimes you couldn't tell where it was, was from, you know, whether it was from Potosi or Mexico or Lima, uh, that could be a little bit difficult. So, uh, which actually plays an important role in uh, the upcoming fraud. So I'll share my screen again. Okay. So how important were these coins to the global economy? Uh, the amount of silver that was mined from Potosi was immense. Early in its discovery, Holy Roman Empire, Emperor Charles V called Potosi, quote, the treasury of the world. Despite having been discovered just about halfway through the 16th century, Cerro Rico produced about 60% of the world's silver for that century. In the 265 years as a colony, uh, it produced about 20% of the world's silver. Needless to say, Potosí was at the core of Spanish wealth and uh, leading to this city to be called the quote-unquote first city of capitalism. So beyond Spain, uh, silver that was mined in Potosí grew into, the, uh, into an engine uh, of international network. About 90% of all Potosí silver became a part of this global economy. In Europe and beyond, this silver was the end factor for a centuries-long bullion famine that perpetually wrecked uh, economies and livelihoods. Uh, the silver would exit Spain, uh, cross Europe, eastward towards the Ottoman and Safavid empires, uh, to Mughal, Mughal uh, India, to the Ming and Qing empires. Uh, eventually, by 1565, they uh, figured out a uh, Western route uh, directly to the Philippines, uh, the Manila, Manila trade. Um, so uh, as you can see in this map to the right, silver was literally circulating the globe by this point. Um, and these trade routes are really just the major ones. I mean, it doesn't even show the fact that Spanish American silver was entering the North American colonies, but it, it was. These are really just the major, major trade routes that they're showing here. Uh, and it really just splinters from all of these areas to, to really uh, um, penetrate all of the uh, places that trade was happening during this, this period. Uh, here is an interesting image uh, from uh, the Safavid Empire uh, explaining uh, the importance of Cerro Rico to their, their empire. So they were well aware of how important this one mountain was at the time. Okay, <clears throat> so despite the massive amounts of silver found, most of it found its way into imperial coffers around the world, uh, enriching a, se a selection of European cities and not toward the plight of mankind. In addition to paying for the lavish lifestyles of a privileged few, much of the silver was used to finance wars of global and or regional dom uh, domination. Not only by nearly all nationalities in Europe, uh, but also the Mughals, the Ottomans, Safavids, and so on. The imperial, economic, and belligerent actions of the holders of all of this silver caused the coins of Potosi to become the first global currency of exchange and forced Potosi to become the center of the first explosive development of global and intercontinental exchange. This is really the first global kind of rush that we see. Um, usually people think of the, uh, the California gold rush as kind of this earliest one, uh, but it really was Potosi that people from all around the world came. Uh, according to anthropologist Jack Weatherford, Potosi made the money that irrevocably changed the economic complexion of the world, which is quite a statement. All right, so before we continue about uh, Potosi, uh, what is debasement? Because now we're talking about a term here. So uh, debasement is uh, the lowering of the finest of the precious metal in a coin and replacing it with a less valuable metal. Many of us are uh, familiar with debasement. Uh, it's happened since the beginning of coinage and uh, sometimes happens today. Throughout history, individuals have debased coins with a variety of baser metals. In gold silver coins, various monarchs have lowered the precious metals uh, content of their coinage, replacing some of the gold and silver with copper uh, was common. Uh, this was legal debasement as it was officially sanctioned. 
uh, though not necessarily always tolerated by the people. Some even illegally replace gold with platinum, uh, though still uh, rather valuable when compared with copper. Um, uh, the similarity and uh, specific gravity made such a coin less uh, detectable, so people actually uh, got away with, with that as well. Uh, again, not all debasement is fraudulent, as a government could legally change the fineness of their coinage to meet a specific need. Uh, in the case of Potosi coinage, however, it's, it's rather interesting. Uh, debasement took place in the form uh, illegally replacing up to half the silver, uh, essentially cutting the intrinsic value of coins in half while passing them off as fully intrinsic pieces. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, we can see the visual effects of debasement through uh, Roman Antonianus of the uh, 3rd century. So um, you can kind of see how if you go from left to right, all these coins are supposedly the same um, denomination, and they are, uh, but as time went on, they got a little bit more pink, and that's due to increased levels of copper as time went on. And as you'll see, uh, this happened with uh, Potosi coins in particular. So in theory, uh, coins produced at Potosi were essentially the same uh, as those in other Spanish American mints, except in far greater numbers in the 17th century. Each eight real coin was legally uh, weighed 27.5 grams at a fineness of about 93.1%. Uh, however, in February, I'm sorry, October 4th, 1589, uh, the structure of the Potosi mint uh, altered and this actually led to uh, what allowed for the debasement. Um, so prior to this point, um, all of the authorities at the, uh, at the Potosi Mint were chosen by the Viceroy. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Potosi Mint, um, the structure of the Potosi Mint altered from one that was operated by individuals chosen by the Viceroy to one that was operated by individuals who won their positions at auction. So this is the key difference. Before they were uh, appointed by the voice, Viceroy, uh, and later they actually just simply bought their position. Uh, this allowed for more and more opportunities for greed to get the best of Mint officials. The two positions that are important for this story are those of assayer and Smelter. Uh, and those positions weren't cheap either. Uh, that of Assayer was auctioned for $85,000 in 1632, uh, and that sum has not been adjusted for inflation. That's $85,632. With such high initial expenditures, regaining some of this money through debasement proved to be tempting. Uh, by the first decade of the 17th century, rumors began to spread that authorities were taking advantage of the privileged situation and a royal inquiry was launched. In April of 1617, the Viceroy publicly acknowledged the occurrence of debasement and the situation quickly rebounded, uh, notably with the addition of dates to the coins of the mints. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so we can go to the coin uh, camera and I will show you some of these coins from the first debasement. So uh, here is, these are from uh, Philip IV. I'm sorry. Philip III, here's an eight real coin. Uh, here is a two real coin, as you can see, if we compare this to an earlier coin, they're just getting a little bit, a little bit pinker. You can see some copper kind of showing through. I don't know how well that's shown through on the uh, screen. It looks to be okay on mine. Um, and this is kind of the norm for this period. And it does quickly rebound um, once uh, everything comes to light in 1617. Show the screen. All right. Uh, but then the situ situation, again, quickly deteriorated with the ascension of Philip IV. Uh, fourth, however, uh, and debased coins were struck with both date and the sayer's initials deliberately missing from the coins as to conceal the origins. So I showed you how these cobs are missing a lot of vital information from the obverse and reverse, and uh, oftentimes it is believed that uh, uh, coins in Potosi were uh, deliberately, deliberately 
uh, done this way when it was known that the metal was debased. So uh, by 1630, though, uh, things seemed to be back to normal. By this point, it was estimated that Potosi had struck about 1 million eight real coins and about 2.5 million coins of lower denominations. All right, so this is when the, uh, the, the great fraud starts to kick in. So between 1631 and 1648, uh, the coinage of Potosi experienced a downward spiral of both quality and fineness, uh, the former being used to hide the latter. So uh, as the, again, again, as I just mentioned, as the fineness got lower and lower, so did the quality, and it is believed that this is to mask um, the, the lowering and the debasement. Coins with clear dates and assayers initials again became scarce, not knowing who made what and when. Those responsible for debasing the coins thought they could get away, or that thought they could hide their identity once the coins entered the global markets. As early as the 1620s, authorities sent to investigate or who stumbled upon it on their own were bribed in order to remain silent. Uh, in the 1640s, merchants in Antwerp and Genoa began to report coins well below standard finest, and in the uh, mid-1640s, enough rumors had spread that Philip IV sent Francisco Nostardes Marin to investigate. Um, and to do this, uh, Nostardes Marin was actually named the president of the entire Audiencia, so that blue-green area that I showed you. Uh, which was roughly a third of all of South America, uh, he became president of. Um, and at this point, he was one of just a handful of people who was just literally two steps below the king, uh, showing the level of importance that the Spanish uh, government put on the situation. His primary task as president was to root out the culprits in the situation. Unlike early investigators, uh, his past um, uh, proved that he would be less culpable of being bribed or threatened into silence. Uh, he diligently worked on this case for about two years. Uh, furthermore, his position as Audiencia president um, gave him un unfettered access to basically any resource that he needed, uh, but also gave him the right to punish without appeal. So he basically had um, all control over this situation, and the Spanish monarch wanted it uh, ended as quickly and and um, and harshly as possible. Uh, 1648, uh, the situation was brought again to the forefront as complaints of the coins mounted. That year, assayers in Spain revealed that most of the coins produced in Potosí were worth about five reales instead of eight. Uh, some were even less, containing less than 50 percent silver. Perhaps ironically, Philip IV of Spain proclaimed, quote, in silver lies the security and strength of my monarchy. Perhaps not fully realizing that the silver veins were beginning to run dry and compounded with the debasement problems, the end of Spain as a global hegemon was nearing its end. And as you can see here, you, uh, the image to the right, you see a Spanish monarch uh, with the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, uh, clutching them over Cerro Rico. So it kind of just brings home this whole um, point that, that uh, this mountain is kind of the, the one thing that's funding the entire Spanish monarchy for, for quite a while. Um, I'm going to end that so I can show you the actual debased coins of the great debasement. So this is actually the image that we had uh, in the announcement for the long table, the $16.48. Uh, here's another one um, from 1637. And as you can see, uh, I mean, it's pink because of the copper coming through. Um, the pinker that it is, the higher the copper content. And this was even the case uh, and known in the 17th century. Um, Sometimes there are reports, or there are reports that sometimes the minters could tell when the coins were debased um, and uh, would expect uh, the coins to actually explode on impact. If, if uh, a coin was roughly 50, 50 uh, silver or copper, uh, the copper and the silver can't completely bond uh, as well as it would if it were 90, 10. Um, so uh, it becomes very brittle and actually could explode on impact. Um, this one here does have some 
Um, actually, it is this one again. This one didn't quite you know, explode, but it does have some rim brakes there. Um, you know, planchet brakes from when the, uh, when it was struck. There's another one. So it's from 1631, just as things were getting bad again. This is a two reals. And then we have a four real coin. All right. Check the screen. Okay, so by this point, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, not talk about the coins so much. Uh, by this point uh, in the 1640s, uh, about 150 African slaves worked in the Potosi Mint in a variety of capacities. Uh, they were owned by private individuals and then rented out to the Mint. Uh, it was, in fact, during the initial investigations into the incidents in the mid-1640s that several of these slaves attempted to file complaints against authorities at the Mint. They were threatened with death and some may have actually been killed. Meanwhile, slave owners and mint officials blamed the slaves for debasing the coins and may have even threatened some early investigators uh, from looking into the situation any further. The investigator in 1648, the Stardust Marine, who uh, as we mentioned was the president, found that the slaves did debase the coins, but were forced to uh, do so by corrupt masters in the early hours of the day. Often, the slaves were bribed by the masters with money or drinks to keep them quiet. Uh, before I get into that a little bit more, I want to talk about this really quick. This is a picture of Cerro Rico uh, and the mint and mining operations. Um, I have uh, this image comes from the uh, Hispanic Society up here in New York, and they mentioned this as circa six or 1585. But I've also seen this image as six, circa 1603, so I'm not sure which it is. But um, so, but mercury amalgamation is extremely important uh, to mining and also kind of to the story um, uh, because. Actually, even before the mint was founded in the 1560s, the easy to acquire and mine uh, gold and silver, sorry, silver was already mined and gone by that point, and they needed a new way to extract all the silver, so mercury amalgamation was the answer. It was invented in Mexico in 1554, uh, and this involved low grade ore crushed and ground into powder. Mercury was added, uh, which chemically bonded to the silver. Uh, rock and dirt uh, was washed away, and then the mercury evaporated, leaving behind pure silver. Uh, and this is how uh, immense, immense amounts of silver were mined from um, not only this area, but all areas of the world beginning in the 17th, or 16th century. And, um, and without this, most of the silver that we now have wouldn't exist. It would still just be, uh, you know, kind of in ore in the ground, and we wouldn't be able to access it. Uh, of course, this was uh, performed by slaves. Um, I mean, needless to say, uh, it wasn't the, the, the wealthy Europeans in here um, doing the mercury amalgamation. Um, so we have a slave's testimony. Uh, this is from Pedro Congo. Uh, again, unlike the other witnesses, the slaves had little to lose, and they eventually began to talk. Uh, in August of 1650, during his second round of testimony, enslaved mint worker Pedro Congro stated the following. In the six years time until the arrival of his lordship, the Lord President uh, the, and Inspector General in this villa, there was working in the said cutting house of the master very bad money because of the flat ingots they received from the silver merchants at the same mint, the silver ingots they brought in were a very bad silver appearing to this witness to be half copper and half silver, because when they worked the set of ingots, the money they made fed, fell to pieces, and they melted away in the little furnace where they, uh, where they refire the said silver so as to be able to work it, for which reason there were many losses in the batches that were worked, since much of the copper went up in smoke. And his master, on learning of the shortfalls that appeared in the said batches, cruelly whipped this deponent and his companions, blaming them for stealing that which was lacking, 
But this, but thus, it was that the losses came from the bad silver brought in by the said silver merchants. So essentially, Congo had testified that he and several other slaves were ordered to swap bad ingots for good ones in the middle of the night to get around the routine inspections, uh, being mixed in with the good ingots of quality. The most heavily debased coins were brittle and pink in color due to the high amount of copper. Uh, on one of the incidents that he witnessed, 600 pounds of adulterated ingots were mixed in with good ones. So uh, another slave, Juan Ventura, uh, testified directly after Congo. Uh, Ventura had worked for the Mint for 12 years by 1650. He was owned by the boss of the Cutting House, which is where they uh, uh, made planchets. In earlier times, he had worked as a picador, adjuster, a micador, which is a trimmer, adjuster, or examiner. Um, but more recently, he had also worked in hammering, trimming, and adjusting when needing. Uh, according to Ventura, the apex of fraud at the Potosi Mint uh, was in 1648, just as Nostardus Marine was arriving in Peru to combat what had already been happening for decades by that point. On several occasions, Ventura witnessed Andrea Teresa, a female slave owned by Fabian Sanchez Romero, smuggled debased ingots into the cutting house from her master's quarters and hid them in a raw hide chest beneath rolls of tobacco. And the slaves' rations of tobacco, not the owners, so it's less likely to get caught. While this was not the first time that a female was named as an accomplice, uh, this was one of the most detailed accounts to date. In fact, female slaves and free women of color had been routinely accused of fraud by mint officials for decades, uh, but it wasn't known until this time that they, of course, were con uh, coerced to do so and with violence or, or other means. So according to both slave testimonies, this was intentional and systematic fraud. In the end, at least two people were hung for their crimes and publicly displayed. Francisco Gomez de la Rocha, the former corregidor of Potosí, and Juan Ramirez de Arellano, uh, an assayer. Uh, there were some who were also sentenced to death but had fled. Others were fined. Some were removed from their post and or died in prison. So that's the end of the saga that happened. Of course, there's, I mean, this is a brief overview. Uh, there are some good, uh, way more detailed accounts that go into this, um, but, uh, but that gives you a, a good sense of what's happening. Oh, I actually didn't want to do that. I'm going to share my screen again. So here we can see um, a possible reason why the miners might want to begin to debase. Of course, uh, profits and greed and fraud, uh, greed were obviously a reason why people would do that. Uh, however, if we look at this uh, graph to the right, um, by 1630, we actually see that silver began to uh, plateau. Um, you know, it's about a third uh, of the way across the graph, uh, the amount of silver begins to plateau. Um, I'm sorry, by 1600 begins to plateau, by 1630 it begins to completely drop off. And this is uh, the beginning of the, the worst period of debasement. Um, and some historians and numismatists have actually called this debasement a quote unquote natural response to this uh, decline. Um, if you are a miner uh, of silver and your the amount um, of silver is plateauing or declining, uh, really, the only way to uh, expend this is to um, essentially dilute it and debase it with, with copper. So you get more copper uh, or more silver, quote unquote, more silver with actually less amount of silver. So this is possibly one of the reasons why, uh, why it happens as a quote unquote natural response to the decline. So now fixing the problem. Uh, a new assayer was brought in, someone who they thought everyone could trust, uh, Juan Rodriguez de Rodas, uh, beginning in January of 1652 to help reinstate trust in the coins. All pieces struck in Potosi uh, were debased, regardless of their fineness. Um, that's how they consider them. So anything struck before 1652, they just consider them to be debased, regardless of what it actually was. The former debased coins were known as rachunas at this point. Uh, so, um, uh, because of uh, an earlier assayer named Francisco Gomez de la Rocha. Um, 
uh, while the new coins shrunk out of Rodas were known, were known as uh, Rodasas. So Rotunas, the earlier debased coins, were devalued by 25% across the board, so that eight real coins were worth six reals. Uh, four real coins were worth three reales. Uh, however, again, to help reinstate trust in the coins, even the new coins were deval devalued since they did not quite reach the acceptable finest either, um, though at a, uh, quite a lesser degree. So all the coins of the denom denominations were countermarked to relay their new value, while coins valued two reales and lower were not subjected to this revaluation. Some unscrupulous individuals would uh, re counter stamp Rochunas with the mark of the more valuable Rodasus, uh, thus making it harder for the plan to regain trust in the coinage to take effect. Uh, in, in 1657, all the coins, both the Rochunas and the Rodasus, were completely demonetized and replaced by the newly designed coins that were rem reminiscent of earlier Lima style coinage. Uh, this transition began in, in March of 1652. Uh, most Rotunas and Rodasas were melted, assayed, and converted into this new type. As a result, counterstamp coins are relatively scarce today, but are undoubtedly relics of one of the greatest instances of illegal debasement and fraud in numismatic history. Uh, here at the INS, we actually only have one of the counterstamped uh, coins. Uh, you can see it here, uh, right across the, the uh, Cassilin-Lon. Um, you can see the, the crowned L is the, the counter stamp there. Um, and this is, um, again, quite a rare coin because after uh, the new coins were uh, wholly accepted and, um, and the debasement scandal kind of brushed over, all of these Rachunas and Radasas were collected and then melted, uh, leaving them all to be very scarce. Even the earlier non uh, counter stamped examples from the 1620s, 30s, and 40s, even if they didn't get um, um, counter stamped, they're still relatively rare today as well uh, just because they eventually were melted for the, for the uh, more trusted newer type. Which we will get to in a minute. So, the effects of the great Potosi fraud of 1649 stretched far and wide. Uh, as soon as definitive word on the extent of the debasement was publicly released, trust of Peruvian silver plummeted. Uh, at first, this was applied to all Spanish silver, but that situation was quick, uh, quickly mitigated um, as the extent of fraud was learned to come that Potosi mint was the only uh, mint involved. Two sectors that were immediately felt uh, the pain were in the payment of goods and in war. With nearly everyone lacking any trust in these coins, uh, they stopped accept accepting them in payment. Creditors demanded payment in other forms of specie, even when there is no good uh, specie to be had. This was especially true. The Spanish government decided on what to do uh, with the debased coins. So during the 1649 to 1651 period, before they started counter-striking, um, people literally had no idea how much their money was worth. Uh, so they didn't spend it because they didn't know if it was worth, if a coin was worth five or seven or eight reales, um, either legally or in intrinsically, they, they literally had no idea. In many places, as a result, Trade came to a complete standstill. Uh, the avail availability of consumer products reduced and prices rose. Soldiers within the Spanish army began to refuse payment in coins from Potosi, putting a severe damper on any bellicose aspirations the empire had at that point. Uh, perhaps it's no coincidence that Spain never won and never another major war for the rest of the century, and the Habsburg Empire collapsed at the beginning of the next. This distrust was not only felt in Spanish America and Europe, but worldwide as the coinage of Potosi had long made its mark in the global economy by the mid-17th century. Even the Ottomans and the Safavids had difficulty paying for war at this time as a good amount of silver in circulation there had originated in Potosi. Meanwhile, it took decades in certain areas to deflate back to normalcy uh, price-wise. Many, even at the same time, saw this uh, as the beginning of the end of the Habsburg Spain. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So we saw uh, the earlier coins. So I'm going to pull out maybe three coins right now. So 
So here we have one of the earlier de uh, debased ones. Then we have uh, the one with the counter stamp again. Uh, and you can tell that this one is debased just because of how pink it is. So they were right in, in counter stamping that. But then we have the new design all the way to the right. Uh, you can see it's quite different. Uh, there are waves, there's the pillars on it. Um, you know, there's, there's more, uh, you know, words and numbers and letters in, in the middle of the coin as opposed to uh, this, which does not. So the, the, the design changed for certain, uh, and it does revert back to mid 16th century coins, which I should have grabbed one, but I didn't, unfortunately, to show you how they mimic them. But they do look very similar to this, so no need to fret. Um, and this was actually, even though to the untrained eye, uh, you know, to these both look like crude Spanish American coins, but to someone in the 17th century, they could tell the difference and say, ah, one is the earlier type and one is the more modern type. Um, one is the debased era and one is not the non-debased era. So this minor change in, um, in design actually did help uh, revert the situation back to normal. So now I'm going to switch gears completely. Uh, if we can get the coin camera back up one more time. So I'm going to give a little preview of where I'm going next and it might be unexpected. All right, so that is, many of you may know, to be a New England shilling. That's where we're going next. All right, now I'd like to connect the history of these coins with another seemingly unrelated group of coins, the Massachusetts Bay silver coinage that first appeared in 1652. The reasons for creating this mint at this particular time has been the topic of discussion in the past, and while the occurrences at the Potosi Mint are sometimes listed as a reason. The primary reason given usually revolves around the turmoil that England was experiencing at the time, um, the end of the Civil War, and uh, when Oliver Cromwell forced the interregnum period of Charles I and Charles II, and between 1648 and 1660. Um, two primary sources have recent. Two primary sources have recently come to light that help affirm that it was, in fact, not the interregnum period of England, but the debased coins of Potosi that encouraged the mint to begin. Uh, the first comes from John Hull, uh, the mint master of the Massachusetts Mint, and therefore perhaps the foremost authoritative source on this topic, who said uh, in his diary, quote, Upon occasion of much counterfeit coin brought into the country, that'd be the debased coin, and much loss accruing in that respect, and that dedication of a stoppage of trade, the general court ordered a mint to be set up and to coin it, bringing it to the sterling standard for fineness. And they made choice of me for that employment, and I chose my friend Robert Sanderson to be my partner, which the court consented. So here, John Hull himself, who founded the mint, said it's because of debased coins that uh, a new mint was needed in Massachusetts to help raise the fineness of the coins that were then in, in circulation. A second uh, source is a little bit later. It's from 1677, but these coins are still in circulation, so it is still contemporaneous with the coins themselves. Uh, here, the second source, source clearly states that Potosi is the primary cause for the concern in Massachusetts. Uh, in 1677, as Hull and Sanderson were still striking the pine tree ceilings, um, this person here, uh, his name is Robert Slew, an international merchant and author of a global trade and monetary conversion book, noted that in Massachusetts, quote, many base new Peru pieces of eight, which being discovered, an act was made against them, and they should not go for current payment. So the people in whose hands they were scattered were hereby necessitated to have them refined and so coined. Though there was much loss, yet something was saved. So based on these two accounts, while the interregnum period in England possibly gave the Massachusetts Bay General Court the nerve to create such a mint, after all, no king was there to stop them, it was never given as the reason by contemporaries, or even a reason. A debased Spanish coin was clearly the primary concern of those in Massachusetts and created the mint as a way to rebuild the value of the coins there and therefore the trust as well. Furthermore, as uh, according to Lou, the Massachusetts mint performed these corrections at a loss. 
uh, as they needed extra silver to raise the finest of the coins back to an acceptable amount. So, in conclusion, uh, the Potosi Mint was undoubtedly the most important mint for the production of global silver from the late 16th through mid-17th centuries. It produced unpre unprecedented amounts of silver that were largely coined into eight real pieces for the sake of international trade. However, due to the inter inner workings of this mint essentially operating as a private entity, fraud and debasement easily tempted many officials and merchants in Potosi. For decades, this problem ran unchecked. It, went, it was eventually found that many coins were intrinsically worth just 50% of their intended value. The market responded with distrust towards the coins, causing economic stagnation, shortages, and inflation on a global level. While the insufficient coins were replaced within a decade, the global invocations took decades to subside. Elsewhere, others also had to contend with these old debased coins in circulation, with one reaction being the founding of the Massachusetts Mint to strike silver coinage. To reiterate a point that I made at the beginning of this talk, the great Potosi Mint fraud of 1649, while seemingly minor in the grand scheme of things, had profound and long-lasting effects on the economic life for many people through the world in the late uh, 17th century. Thank you. So that's that. Uh, are there any questions? We have about 15 minutes to go. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to um, uh, field the questions. I can see them now. Uh, we have one question from Robert, uh, Robert Hogue. Where did the piece of Platicoriente come from and from whom? Um, do you mean uh, who made it, or how did we acquire it, or Bob, if you want to, uh, can't even see it, unmute, or if you want to uh, clarify in the in the chat. Uh, both both of those, Jesse. Who was the person uh, from whom it came, and we know who made it, or when or where. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. Do we know when and where it was made, and also who gave it? Or where uh, when and where uh, is roughly 1545 to 1568. I mean, all we can do is, is roughly estimate that from when Cerro Rico was discovered to when um, uh, the Lima Mint was, was uh, founded. And it, it actually could have gone after that, but that's kind of the rough estimation of dates that are generally given with them. Um, and this was actually a donation uh, from Dr. Uta uh, Vartenberg. So, uh, uh, thank you, Uta. This is our uh, the president of the INS. So uh, that's, that's how we acquired it. Those are very rare, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been uh, asking her for a while if we could acquire one, and um, and she saw this actually at the uh, recent INC, um, uh, the New York Inc. show in January, and and uh, and uh, acquired it for us. So it was very gracious of her. That's a very important acquisition. I agree. All right. Uh, next question. Roger Moore, very enjoyable talk. Info on Matt Silver is great. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Wire Williams, where did all the mercury come from uh, from refining the silver? Um, that was mined as well. I'm not sure if it was all imported or if they found local sources for it, um, but they had to mine that as well. And I did come across some good um, quotes from this period along the lines of without mercury there would be no silver so uh, the role of mercury in this uh, shouldn't go unchecked and, and it was even uh, very much well known that you know, it was how important it was to the mining operations at the time so sorry Ray that I can't specifically answer that but it, it was mined specifically for this I'll get back to you on that um, Mike Markowitz what are some of the published references for the story um, there's uh, quite a few uh, really good ones. There's uh, this new book that was, I'm trying to think of the uh, gentleman's name who wrote it, but it's just called Potosi, um, the city that changed the world or something along those lines. Uh, there's a good book that's specifically on the 1652 transition, if you're looking for something that's purely numismatic. Um, it traces uh, 
I think there's something like eight or twelve steps that uh, that you know that go from this early design to the late all within 1652. Um, so there's that. Uh, um, those are really the two that I, that I uh, would focus on numismatically or um, or historically. Um, and there's a there's others that I was using um, that are just slipping my mind. They're on my desk right now. So, uh, Eric. Kraus, is there evidence that Potosi Mint officials were given production quotas? Uh, were there bonuses in, uh, or incentives, incentives to increase production? I was wondering that as well. Um, it could be the case. It all depends on who was doing the, the debasement. Uh, if it was the Mint officials, then that's a, a possible um, uh, explanation to it, but if it is these miners uh, who are doing it before the mint ever gets them, uh, then then I would say no. And it actually kind of, when you look at the slave testimony, it almost uh, points to this uh, this latter thing happening, where it is specifically the miners um, doing it, uh, kind of coercing the slaves into into making this happen, um, and that's why the mint officials are uh, specifically blaming the slaves because to them, it is them that's doing it, the slaves that's doing it, but they don't know that they're being coerced into do it, doing it. So um, looking at this, you know, whatever, 350 years removed, I, I blame the miners too and not necessarily the mint officials at this point. Um, but that doesn't mean it was only them, it could have been others as well. Uh, Karen Carr, could you speak to the effect of Chinese demand for silver in all of this? I thought part of it was that Chinese demand for silver was satisfied by around 1600, and they went from paying high prices to paying ordinary prices for silver. Uh, yes and no. I mean, Chinese demand for silver never subsided, uh, and um, I mean, it just kept going. And really, when you see the, um, I showed the, the kind of lull in silver coin production, uh, once further mines, uh, specifically in uh, Mexico, opened up, the coin and silver production shot back up, uh, so that by the mid 18th century, you have that demand and production, both the supply and demand are met once again. Um, and even in the United States, uh, as late as uh, you know, 1800, 1810, um, and even beyond, the United States alone is sending something like six or seven million dollars in Spanish American coins in particular to China just to, to, for demand um, to buy what they want. And they know that um, that the the Chinese market also depends on this Spanish American silver. Um, so so yes, there is great demand. It might wax and wane at times, but as far as it being uh, completely satisfied, that that's not the case. Uh, Richard Green, you mentioned the ratio of silver to gold of eleven to one or eleven point five to one, changing to sixteen to one. What happened to the ratio? after the 1649 fraud was discovered. Um, uh, it didn't revert back. There may have been some upset in it, but it didn't, I don't think any um, uh, coin issuing authority changed it back, reverted it any uh, great degree after the fraud. And really this quote unquote 16 to one that I mentioned is probably more like 15 to one uh, that eventually becomes 16 to one. So. Uh, even you know, in this period, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, governments are still kind, kind of playing with this 15, 16 to 1, uh, and even the U.S. government is doing that into the, into the 19th century. Um, fascinating. Was similar debasement done at other contemporary New World mints like Mexico City? Uh, it may have been, but not to the degree that this was. This is a, a rather isolated case and, and wasn't. Um, you know, officially sanctioned by the Spanish government, so it wasn't. Uh, you know, uh, all the mints weren't directed to do this. This was this was definitely a, um, an isolated case in Potosi. Hilton Lucio, hello, Hilton. Uh, Hilton's joining us from Brazil, so thank you, uh, Jesse. Could you share the references for the complaints of the European merchants of the coin fine fineness? Uh, thank you, Hilton. Um, I can share them with you, uh, but I can't do it now uh, because I don't have them with me. Uh, but I can, I'll be in contact with you uh, via um, 
uh, email. Hilton's doing great, great research on, on counterfeiting down in Brazil, so uh, always happy to, to share with Hilton. Uh, I lost my space on the chat. Oh, Larry Schwimmer, given the scale of the theft, what happened to the money stolen uh, from the large seniorage? Was it widely distributed in bribes or were there mint officials living extremely large? Again, I think that this might go back to uh, who's doing it. Um, I think that the any profits that are being made from this were already made by the time that the coins were minted. So it's the uh, the mint official, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, the miners who are bringing in this this tainted silver, and they're the ones kind of living large off of it. Um, here we go. History of mining mining in Latin America from colonial era to the present. Um, it's a good source on it, uh, and I'm sure that there there are many many sources, um, especially for uh, in Latin American sources uh, in Spanish. Um, they seem to give it a, a more of a thorough treatment than, than English um, sources do. Bill Summers, uh, can you comment on what Cerro Rico and Potosi are like today? Is there still any mining or minting? Uh, there is mining. Um, I, uh, minting is still done there, but it's not at that uh, old mint house. Um, it's, uh, the mint is still located in Potosi. Um, uh, it's not any sort of metropolis like we would imagine um, a, a, a large, uh, you know, source of wealth to, to be because all of that wealth was extracted, uh, unfortunately. Um, so just like the pictures that I showed you early on, um, I mean, I'll share my screen and I can, I'll show you. So this, this is a contemporary picture of, of Cerro Rico and Potosi, and um, there are no high rises. Uh, it's all, you know, flat village essentially at this point. Um, there's still quite a few people there. Um, I think it might be 265,000 people is the, the current population or something like that. So it's not a small place, but it's not anything grand. It didn't, it didn't uh, experience the wealth and, and growth that London or um, you know, Seville experienced from this mountain, unfortunately, because it was all extracted. Okay, uh, Lawrence Edwards, Spain was running, uh, was in running conflict with England, Romana defeated 1588. Could there be an element of creating economic chaos as war by other means? Holland was also an expanding economic power. Did this scandal undermine their trade as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it undermined everyone's trade. It's, it, this wasn't just a problem that the Spanish experienced uh, because people's um, trust wasn't necessarily in who they were dealing with, but the medium of exchange that they were hoping to get back in, in course of this uh, economic transaction. Um, they didn't necessarily distrust the Spanish or the French or the Dutch at this time. They distrusted the money. So it absolutely disrupted everyone's trade at this point. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Bob Hogue. Thank you, Hilton, for the kind words. Um, yep, there's a Wikipedia entry for Mike, uh, or for the mint fraud, as Mike uh, mentioned. Uh, so that's good. That gives you a nice little brief. Um, you know, synopsis of it. Mercury mining and empire, the human and ecological cost of colonial silver mining in the Andes. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Another great source. Um, doesn't look like there are any other questions. Uh, kind words from Daniel, Richard, Ray, Sarah, Eric. Thank you all.